So I, I want to thank everybody for, for, for uh, their, their contributions. And it's now my opportunity really to hand over to our moderator, Anche, to, uh, to field questions and to, to generate the discussion. I'm on the end of the Zoom meeting here to take any questions that would come online. So for those people who are attending online, feel free to make comments or add questions in the chat. Andre, I want to hand over to you, Anmas. Great. Yes. Thank you so much, Jason. And you know, first of all, thank you to you, Jason, and to David, and really to all of you. Um, for inviting me to partake in this conversation, you know, from distant California. And um, thank you for the presenters for these really thoughtful reflections on, you know, kind of what we've all gone through collectively um, in the past year or year and a half. Um, when Jason first contacted me um, about this symposium, um, I was really uh, fascinated by his linking uh, to Wakefield's back loop um, which is really a description of how we might connect planned and unplanned uh, events in or thinking in a seamless loop of learning. And uh, certainly I share with all of you um, a big set of lessons, right, of um, what has happened really and what has changed um, in the past year. You know, perhaps to name just a couple, um, Kind of understanding how um, the, the distance learning has really crossed boundaries that were previously established, perhaps namely bringing learning and knowledge production into the realm of domestic space, um, you know, fragmenting kind of how we present ourselves in a kind of social context uh, on Zoom. And then at the same time, how distance learning has also redrawn barriers and access to education in different ways, not necessarily breaking down all the boundaries, you know, but offering some lessons, I think, that we can take forward. And I feel like now we are in this moment where um, we have a unique opportunity to bring together um, the techniques that we've learned during this unplanned adaptation and, you know, kind of this moment of, of developing resilience to an unknowable condition with an intention to plan how we go forward with this as we critically rethink um, architecture education. So in listening to um, the four presenters, a few themes seem to come uh, to the foreground often in multiple presentations. So I'll start by kind of naming those um, uh, to get the conversation started. Um, I heard uh, perhaps Bud and Jeff talk about new ways of collaboration social interaction and social learning opportunities and that were brought about in the in an age of distancing and in new formats of you know kind of relating to one another um, i was really fascinated by the description of um, the change of perspective that has happened through um, you know zoom interactions etc um, i heard um, uh, some of you talk about the altered perception of everyday spaces, you know, be it through the, a new sense of distance, you know, and the fear of contact, but also um, the, the kind of difference in perception that's come about through the absence of translation from drawing to building. And, um, you know, that in itself presented in a way a critique of the immediacy of digital modeling and digital workflows that have been foregrounded during this time of remote learning. Then maybe as the third theme, I've heard um, several of you talk about words like agency and action, and of course they're opposite, um, and really appreciated Peter's foregrounding of agency as dependency, um, a dependency on a context and circumstance that may not always be favorable, um, rather than agency as an act of complete freedom, where we just do what we want whenever we want. Um, and uh, this is, of course, then also kind of highlighted through uh, the range of different Zoom interactions and the shaping of entirely new languages, right, that uh, come about as we revisit ways of representing ourselves and representing our ideas. And then lastly, perhaps coming back to Jeff and Bud, um, talking about activation and access and the different motivations um, that have emerged, you know, for considering new partnerships and taking on new types of problems, you know, say in the context of public space 
And, um, you know, to come back to Bud's presentation, the kind of creative activation and also abuse of online platforms, you know, like Instagram, um, or perhaps of analog vehicles like trucks for entirely new purposes. So in a way, you know, the, the observation about what has emerged in online learning offers all of us an opportunity to critique um, patterns of learning and teaching in architecture that we've taken for granted and that have been around for a very long time. And I'd like perhaps to start this conversation by asking the four of you what you really think we can take forward, right, from these kind of adaptive modes and uh, sort of emergency modes that you all have focused on, um, but looking at those really as part of a larger tool set that we now have, you know, to critique established modes of teaching. Colleagues, who wants to respond? Well, I can start. I mean, I showed a number of kind of technical things in which I dove into during the pandemic in terms of digital modeling to rendering workflows. So that was kind of one thing I was putting in the presentation to answer that question. But I'm just thinking about Peter's presentation and the way in which he kind of stepped back and, and uh, allowed us to think about the Zoom interface more generally, and particularly this notion of giving way and how that applies to design education. I remember one of the early conversations I had with Bud as we were in online learning, I was telling him I felt like I was talking too much, that wanting to fill up all the space of silence in the Zoom room, because there's a little bit of hesitancy for students to respond. It's different than being in person. And I think you were saying you had that issue at first and then decided just to let there be long points of silence and really kind of letting that silence linger there, which um, was a productive thing in order to get the conversation going. And so I think there are these moments where um, stepping back and not trying to con overly control it applies to the, the Zoom interface, but I think also has direct implications about how you would create a culture within a studio more generally. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Zoom opened up a lot of possibilities and a lot of frustrations in this process. I, I think the most maybe optimistic side of, of, uh, of the way we were working is the complete freedom to mix formats, to have a live review working on physical things with people joining by Zoom, a, you know, an event like this typically in the past would not involve people from elsewhere. Everyone would be here. We'd have to buy plane tickets, put them up in a hotel, come up with a budget for that. Um, but very quickly, we can put together an event or a teaching situation that is much more um, fluid and, and open. And I, I think that's maybe the part of it that I've, I, I'm hopeful can, can actually sort of improves how we teach. Um, but you know, I'm also very interested in maybe in a, in a sort of similar way of how sort of physical making, um, and my studio obviously is based on making something at full scale, um, how that can start to merge with, with the virtual um, and, and in term, not just in terms of process, but also output. Yeah, just to, to piggyback on that, um, I guess I need to keep my mask on. Uh, yeah, like so tomorrow we have our mid review. Is that tomorrow? Yes. And, uh, and we ha I have folks from Auburn like on meeting with us, uh, which I would never do to your point, Jeff. Like I would never fly someone in, especially for a mid review. I would be hopeful that I might be able to get someone to come in final review, but those like, and I think I, I mentioned this in my presentation that I, now we can like swap. Like, hey, I'll sit on yours if you sit on mine, and it's advantageous for that school and it's advantageous for us at UNL. And so those, those partnerships uh, become pretty strong between faculty and even like seeing students work in other places I think is really important. So if I'm sitting on sec second year uh, reviews at another university, what are they doing? What's successful in the work that they're doing? What can we take from that and bring back to, to UNL? Um, so I, I think that's one of the kind of more powerful things that's come out of this online Zoom world. Uh, of course, I think it's important that I jump in at this moment to say that our reflections are important, but of course, uh, they are, uh, we're, we're equally looking for reflections from the students on 
on this as well. So this conversation is a conversation to be had by everybody. Uh, so I'm particularly interested in any questions that you would want to bring or observations that you want to, want to bring about the experiences that we are speculating on at the moment. We are say, less at the point of rece receiving than, than you are. So please feel free to join in, ask questions, uh, make observations as we, as we move forward on this. And I have a microphone here if anybody wants to do that <laughs> as well. While we're waiting for questions to be formulated, um, I would probably tag on uh, one more sort of questions for the question for the group, which is um, about the unplanned, right, and the role of the unplanned as we go forward. I think we all probably catch ourselves um, in the, the sort of relief that, you know, now we're perhaps in a moment where uh, things become more planable again, right? And to uh, work from that security of like, oh yeah, you know, I'm now, I know what I'm gonna do um, in, the, in my next class, in the next review, you know, in the next partnership. Um, I would love to hear from all of you where you see the, the merits of um, leaving room for the unplanned, you know, given sort of how you were asked, basically the creativity perhaps that it brought out in the situation where you were asked to be responding to an unplanned situation and how we might in fact going forward integrate um, sort of moments for unplanned um, conditions, planning for the unplannable, if you will, in our teaching and learning. Well, I certainly, I mean, I think in terms of some of my observations about the presentations, and particularly I was struck by uh, something that occurred both between, uh, in a happenstantial way between between Zach and Bud's presentations, which were the, uh, kind of a similar quality of an erased landscape appeared. And you were approaching it from two very, very different angles. I found it startling in a way how, in both cases, there seemed to be a, a, a kind of appropriateness, perhaps an unplanned appropriateness, or an unplanned mode of desensitized kind of expression Seem to seem to be be appearing in different ways, and so and Zach and I hope that this in this speculation about drawing, one doesn't make any want to make any fixed or, or or predetermined sort of interpretations of what that rendering style would mean, the mode of representation would mean, or in fact, you know, in Bud making those observations about the effects of of abandonment of public space and an immediate reaction. But I was really struck about how, I mean, you said, well, I went to my doctors, you know, um, or this was the doctors. And I looked at that image and I thought, yes, that's my doctor as well. And then I looked again, <laughs> my doctor's place, and I looked again and I realized it wasn't, of course. Right. It was just that sort of generic on the edge of Lincoln kind of, kind of do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I find that kind of thing both terrifying <laughs> and extremely amusing as well yes. at, the, at the same time. Um, and so I, I, I get the impression that that sense of abandonment was sort of palpable, palpable on behalf of the students on the other end of Zoom meetings, you know. Or that sense of, um, that kind of our experiences of the tangibility of the world had sort of been erased or reduced down. So the couch that you showed that bed over the top of it, you know, could almost be, be a rendering. There's something about it which was so evacuated as, as, as an image. And I, I don't think those things are entire, I don't know what the link is between those two, two, two aspects of it, but in some senses it's a mode of expression that I think is about architecture, but not a capital A, a architecture. It's about the experience of the environment and also experience of negative experiences in a way in a, uh, uh, that, that appear through unplanned events. I don't know. It was a, something very coincidental I saw in, those, in, those, in that work. I mean, I would say, thinking about that, Bud was hinting at an exercise we do in 210, but didn't fully show it, where he had the capital next to the, 
the dorm room you're talking about with the lazy boy under the bed. And the, the premise for the former one before the pandemic was we go to the state capitol, use that as a reference, measure it, model it. Many of the students here did that. And then going into the COVID uh, pandemic, it was actually do the same exercise, but now in your dorm room. And I, I enjoy that one much better because it trains you to see the everyday through that kind of critical lens. That it's not like, okay, I'm going to a work of architecture. I've got to put on my architecture glasses to see it. But you begin to notice things in the everyday environment, which comes through in, in Bud's sort of images of the, the parks, right? And so seeing that strange moment, taking the photographs there, um, that was, again, you know, unplanned, prompted by the pandemic. But I, I kind of prefer it to what the plan was before that. Yeah, I would agree with that. It was these moments of like domestic objects in dorm rooms that were creating voids and volumes by the placement of furniture by students or by parents, whatever, you know, wherever you're particularly located and not having that kind of capital A lens on as you're looking at those. But what are those opportunities within the in, within our spaces? Absolutely. What I wonder in the students as well, that sense of internalization of that being restricted into a very internalized, inward-looking world, that you found things or saw things within your environment that contributed to the way in which you're thinking architectural, right? And one thinks of the traditions of things, things like um, uh, traditions of, 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 of sort of East European animation, right? And some of the great animators that came out, came out of you know, Czechoslovakia and former Soviet countries were people who were locked in their room with only a few objects around them you know, who were restricted. And there's something very expedient about saying, what can I do with what is my, in, within my immediate vicinity? So, I, I mean, I think, but you mentioned that when you started talking about these uh, Cheerios packet. It became relevant when it came, became part of model making and that one can't reverse the influence of something like that even though it was picked up out of a moment of convenience, right? Right. Uh, so, um, that, this is, what interests me about the adaptability, let's say, um, diverse forms of, I think, what Peter refers to, uh, Peter's referring to as agency, but a hesitant and sort of insecure sense of agency that, that belong within, within these things. Peter, are you? Yeah. Um, uh, we lost you for a moment, Peter. Can you hear <laughs> Is that me right? Okay? No, no, I was just quoting back your. <laughs> <laughs> I think we lost you for a moment. I'm just going to, that's all I'm going to say from here on out, just stock <laughs> phrases. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this kind of interest in the kind of hesitancy, tempering things, power over power, these kind of things, the, the pandemic for me brought this to the foreground for a number of reasons. One is I realized I ran a very physical studio, very active, very, students were always moving around the building, going in and outside the building, measuring things, running from printer to desk. And all of a sudden that was, that was kind of voided immediately. Um, and I think the, the kind of change of, of their lives, the unexpected nature of that life, the unexpected nature of my life in the midst of all of this, meant that in some ways I had to both kind of strategically try to map all of this out as I came back from London, in fact, to, to kind of refigure out a whole entire semester. But then, you know, try to kind of figure out how to still build in contingency plans. And I realized that this kind of modulation was kind of a big part of it, just kind of backing down a little bit, backing down from some of the, the kind of agenda items I, I sort of expected to have, and, and then also being kind of patient but then realizing that in some ways there was still a lot of great value in these kind of moments, even though we might not be doing physical models as, as much or as, as rigorously as we would in a normal studio, we're still finding ways to use, you know, junk study models or, you know, uh, literally like hand gestures to like describe a space to someone through, through you know, the description, um, you know, through Zoom. And I think these kind of methods started to kind of, I started to realize that they were tremendously valuable. Um, and I think for me, I mean, I'm obviously still remote, um, but I think when I'm actually able to go back in person, uh, my hope is to, to create some kind of hybrid format where these kind of priorities can come to the foreground. Because I think in, in a lot of respects, they, they, they reach students who don't get the same experience in a physical environment or 
right? It kind of has, it brings other students to the foreground that might fall to the background in, in, in different settings. So I think that's partially why I'm, I'm interested in these kind of things too. Um, perhaps I can add one more aspect to um, this. Um, I really appreciate the mention of um, you know, how suddenly uh, one's domestic space, you know, through Zoom becomes part of, you know, the classroom space or one's personal materials, right, or, or um, you know, leftover packaging or whatever becomes part of how we make or um, how we draw. And in a way, um, I, I would argue this presents uh, new opportunities to um, bring in sort of different backgrounds, right, and different uh, you know, more about the personality of the student, right, than we're normally used to when everyone is together in a neutral studio space or, you know, at the Capitol or in the building. And um, I'm curious how you all think about, um, like, maintaining that aspect, you know, that, that sort of happened by default in ways that we didn't always like, you know, during uh, Zoom times but really does have merits, right? I, I think that's a, that's a really uh, good question because there were obviously, obviously there were uh, advantageous outcomes to being on Zoom. And, and as, as you were talking, I was actually thinking like for the students that I had that had to transition midway, that was probably much more difficult to kind of do that. The ones in the lecture that I was showing were all, they were the first group that were uh, in that kind of Zoom world. And, uh, but I, I think there's, there's ways to like bring what was coming out of uh, the summer studio into kind of the current situation, thinking about uh, uh, these new materials. And, and like, 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 you, like you mentioned, you know, how do we, integrate these other things and thinking about, and I think I alluded to this or maybe I even said it directly, uh, the movement all of a sudden with graphic packages, uh, the color, color theory, there were those conversations that never really happened prior in, in a design studio. And, and I may have said this as well and I can't remember, but um, it also, for right or wrong, ended up impacting students' eating habits because all of a sudden they were buying uh, food based on what the graphic packaging looked like <laughs> <laughs> instead of whether it was healthy or not. You mean they were choosing their meals based choosing... on the type of architecture yes. that they wanted to produce, is that exactly. right? Exactly. So they were choosing it based on packaging that they thought would okay. become a good architectural model. Absolutely. Interesting. Right. Very interesting. <laughs> and I found myself doing the same as I was, you know, making <laughs> example models. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, the microphone, David. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, my question deals with the notion of time, which I think you all, in one way or the other, are addressing. But I'm wondering about it at the role of the student, and particularly the role of engaged thinking and making versus the role of reflection, and that balance between how you might attain that in a physical environment versus what the, the remote environment allowed for or required or loosely um, didn't control and allowed more flexibility within that. And then maybe the, another question would be the role of design studio time as a, as a larger question to that, so. I mean, I think for me when I, discovered breakout rooms in Zoom, it was a game changer. Um, thinking about how I would typically run a studio pre-COVID, you know, desk crits with individual students. The rest of them are back in the studio, um, building a culture, working on their own, but um, just for the expediency, it was typically individual desk crits. When I went into Zoom, just so that I didn't have to like schedule and keep track of times, I would have two or three, three or four students in the same breakout room. And so I would go through those four, then they would leave, and then another group would come in. And so they were, just by that um, way it was structured, they were seeing critiques of their peers more than they would typically. And so that became a really efficient way of getting them feedback and answering questions that didn't have to be redundant over that came from the Zoom format. The thing it didn't allow for is them going back to studio then and having those informal dialogues. They were kind of logging off and 
on their own again. And so I think that's where it really um, fell short. I think from my interactions with the students, it was great. But for their peer-to-peer -peer interactions, it was a, a big challenge that I think we're going to be kind of having to deal with for quite a while to build that culture and community back up. I, I think that's, that's definitely um, in, an important consideration. But I, I think the other issue is just the, the inequities that Zoom brought out, like which students have you know, decent internet access or who has a place at home to work that isn't compromised by being their dining table and they've got other people in the house and there's competition. And um, I think that's one of the, you know, one of the things that really sort of promotes the in-person experience at the school where there is a sort of equalization of resource and we all have the same studio desks, the same um, access to the crit rooms, things like that. Yeah, I'm sure we all have kind of funny stories of, about how that played out. There was a student of mine who was living in a sorority house, and we had studio at 8 in the morning. And so all, everyone else in the house was sleeping, and so the student was finding like, the kind of most secluded closet to whisper through the desk crits. Um, but yeah, no, it, it did definitely kind of come out in strange ways, those inequities. Yeah, I, I also, a lot of students where you would just see like a vague silhouette within rooms because someone was sleeping, a uh, roommate or, or whatever else. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, I think, David, to your, to your point, um, I realized that group projects, breakout rooms, different kinds of activities within Zoom and, and of course other, other mediums, um, but also more group projects to be able to overcome some of that kind of isolation and to create something of a culture, right? What, what we lost in the, in the kind of retreat from studio, trying to kind of gain back through kind of demanding of them to, to stay in touch with everybody and to not become kind of isolated um, and to kind of drift away. Because again, with, with some of the studios where they're kind of introductory or you know, it's, it's a kind of place where there's a hurdle you can lose students, right? And so there can be a kind of, uh, you know, potential kind of, kind of bad downside to, to students kind of just being isolated on their own besides just whatever they want to do project wise. Um, but I think that the tools coupled with some of these kind of things were ways to kind of get them to engage, get them to kind of reflect, you know, finding breakout rooms, spaces where more, you know, smaller groups where they could they could kind of talk to each other or were willing to kind of share in ways that they wouldn't if it were a room of 15 or 20 people um, I think was was ways to kind of get around a little bit the, the the trouble that it created I think I think one of the advantages I, I mean and it's a, a slight one but one of the advantages was that you know during like right before mid reviews or right before final reviews we could actually instead of having to like come to studio and meet with the students we could just like log on and, and talk about hey what, what issues do you guys have you know what drawings are you working on what are the struggles and having that without having to commit a ton of time for us like going into the studio but giving the students a little reassurance before they went into uh, one of these kind of big presentations so that was an advantageous part of, of uh, Zoom world. It made it pretty easy. We could, we could dedicate like 15, 20 minutes and it, was, it wasn't too much uh, skin off our back. Yeah, I, mean, I, certainly, I certainly felt, you know, one, one, of the, uh, one of the advantages, um, I think both Jeff and I have talked about this, but aren't you, maybe you, also somebody involved in design build, uh, might have experienced is that the pressure to communicate in the virtual environment is is something which has to do not just with the educational environment but within a social realm publicly uh, in the public realm or the quasi public realm because when we're trying to deal Jeff and I deal with we almost compete to see who can have the most remote project right <laughs> I don't know what this what this strange game of one downsmanship is but he's his is now six hours away, mine's only four hours away. Seems to be better. Anyway, but what that, what that has meant uh, is that what, what, that, well, what, we, what we suffer from doing design build, particularly in places like this, is the fact that what we do doesn't necessarily get seen in the way that other work is seen in the more immediate environment of the, uni of the university. Um, it's understandable. We want to work in these places. However, I think that what it has done is, is close that distance between us 
and the recipients of those projects and, uh, close that distance between us and our, the people that we work with and enhance the kind of communication so it has facilitated this. And in addition to that, I think that there are methods now that people are much more familiar with ways in which they re represent things that, in, that are real and built, if that's not that's too much of a generalization, but it's what we tend to fall back on when we talk about design build. But the representation of those, the ways, and ways in which they're brought from the remote environment into other environments, I think has also been extremely positive in that, in that sense. Uh, I'm looking for the strangeness of these things as well, though. And, and Zach, when I was looking at your work, and I was wondering if any of your students see somehow what you do might be a way of establishing a kind of virtual authenticity to the studio experience. Are, are students gaming what you do? I mean, when you pull back from the proscenium and show that it is a rendering, then that's the reveal, isn't it? But what's interesting to me is that it, you're almost at that point where a student could simulate being in a studio <laughs> and get away with it. <laughs> do, you know, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. You're producing some kind of real-time faux authenticity of the tactility that we have, have apparently lost. But again, I'm, this is maybe not in, maybe it was not your intention, but I'd love to know if students will go, hey, actually what we can do is get Zach's program and get away with it. We can be at home <laughs> pretending to be working on a desk and show everything on our desk. Who would know the difference? Uh, I wonder if there's some fascinating new model of real-time mm -hmm. studio work being developed in you. Yeah, I like that. No, I think there have definitely been students who have taken it on in those kind of playful ways and have built games into their work. Um, I remember Ethan's project in uh, Arc 210 was a rendering of his building and then on the table was a model of that same building and then in the background was a model from a, the previous project. And so I think there are ways in which they, they kind of take it and sort of run with it in these different directions. Yeah. But no one did simulate their, uh, their whole full studio experience in the way you're <laughs> suggesting. I mean, I, but, yeah, I, don't I mean, I think the collapsing of different forms of representation is there to help us understand what we do in so many ways. When I was looking at your work, I was reminded of the, 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 render, the, the perspective artist that John Soane had, Gandhi, who uh, towards the end of his career um, did a representation of all the buildings that they built as if they were a set on a stage set, a kind, right. of, a kind of portmanteau of all, those, all those, those projects. And the multiple methods of representation, and again, to Robert Evans's point, the more forms of representation we have, the more realms for creativity we, we discover. So if those forms of representation exist somewhere between the real and the virtual and the places, then, then, then it enriches our experiences, I would imagine. So I, no, absolutely. Going back to the discussion on the unplanned, that was just in a, I think we had just hit winter break in the lockdown. We had a really long winter break, if you remember, during COVID, because we ended you know, right at Thanksgiving. And so I went into that just ex playing around and experimenting. And it was only through that kind of working with the representation that I thought, oh, I can make this more like a drawing, or I can make it do this technique of a drawing. And so, you know, we present these things at symposiums as if they are planned acts. But a lot of it is unplanned and kind of found through, throughout the process. But I would agree with you. Yeah, it's, it becomes a way to access a different level of thought um, through representation. So the, 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 as much as I find the, you know, that work sort of fascinating from a disciplinary and pedagogical standpoint, I'm, I'm curious how that can start to impact the physical world. You know, that if we produce architecture in a, in a physical world, how does that way of working influence the physicality. It makes me think of the, a project that Caruso St. John and Thomas DeMond did where, I don't know if you know this, where the, if, if, Thomas DeMond's a photographer, but what he does is build very large scale paper models of real, kind of banal spaces, photographs them, and the models are never seen by anybody. They're, you're just seeing the photographs. But Caruso St. John, they, they did an installation at the Venice Biennale, which showed some of his photographs in a structure that was built like his photographs were sort of returning to the physical world. So they're not exactly like the models, but they're more like the model kind of you know, mediated. And then it collides with a real sort of duct running through the space in an odd way. And I, I'm curious how that, you know, if that's something you think about going beyond, the, so it's just like another level of transformation. Sure, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of people working on that kind of effects of the virtual that then get recreated as physical installations. Um, people talking about the kind of materiality of images. 
a lot of people at Michigan actually working on those kinds of dynamics. The other thing that kind of has the corollary to that is the making the virtual simulate the physical. That is a, there was a whole set of projects that didn't have time to throw in here as well that were doing the inverse of what you're saying, mm -hmm. of actually kind of simulating gravity and seeing yeah. how the virtual doesn't actually literally produce a technical simulation, it becomes this kind of narrative of simulation because it's not, the computing power is not really there in graphics animation software to do true physical simulations. Um, I would say, yeah, I am interested in that generally. I think it's, we're still in a period where it's uh, hard to organize exhibitions and do things physically. Sure. It still feels like we're in a period of putting that all on pause because of social distancing and such. Um, but I definitely could see the work developing in that trajectory. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's some Moss Architects projects where they use you know, physics engines in a computer model and then translate that into a building that has windows that are kind of wonky, like they fell down in the physics engine. And so there, there's some way that that kind of produces a, a product, which is again, just a representation of a process. But anyway. I'd like to take Jeff's I want to take, take uh, Andre, I want to have, grab this opportunity. We have a question from a, from a student <laughs> in the audience. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, no yeah, I guess this is more of a, an observation, but I think there's like a connection between what um, Peter and Zach are talking about. Um, so there's like a dependency on Zoom in terms of like what we can do and communicate, but then there's also like a dependency on the, the programs that we're using. So I'm in Jeff Day's studio and there's kind of like a back and forth between what we can like physically make and what we can like model and work with digitally. So like I'm modeling individual screws to like figure out the distance between things or like simulating the bending of a piece of aluminum and that's there's kind of a back and forth between what I can do in Rhino versus what I can do physically, which is also interesting, which is kind of partially due to, to the pandemic um, on points of Zoom. But yeah, that's just an observation that I have. I, I noticed, I mean, I mean, just to add to that, we noticed that the NIS, sorry, go ahead. Do you want to add? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm not using this. Take it. Um, well, my question deals with model making and how much, like, in previous studios, we allotted a lot of time in model making, understanding scale, connection, volumes in that realm, and so I'm kind of, kind of wondering, like, all that time that we allotted to that, where are you guys pushing that more towards? Is it through like understanding the model more um, spatially through renders or more through section or where are you guys uh, spending that new allotted time in? Do you mean physical models or digital models? Yeah, physical. physical. And, and are you referring to the volume work that was happening primarily digital during COVID? Yeah, like, um, yeah, and also like, uh, was the quality better or was there a hindrance on that due to it being online? That's, yeah, I think it's an ongoing discussion, at least Bud and I are having as we're teaching the same studio now, is last year we didn't have really the possibility of doing physical models. That was one of the reasons I dove kind of deep into the rendering side of things, and now that we're back in the realm of possibility for physical models. You know, how do you reorganize the time and the schedule? Um, how big of the scale, we, how much time are you investing in that? Um, we're still talking about that. Yeah, in, in fact, we were talking about it just prior to this, like where do we go from here and these kind of thoughts on phys physicality of model making, the, the volumes represented in actual materials or is it in the digital realm? I went uh, mostly physical from the kind of abstract Rhino models, went into physical models and, and, and I would say a bit, of, a bit of my approach came from the kind of demake stuff. In other words, like instead of saying, okay, you guys need to make models out of chipboard or whatever it is, they could use anything. So I'm sure if any of my colleagues or the dean were walking past our studio, they would think, what is Bud's studio doing? <laughs> because it just looked like this mess, this experimentation of anything you could imagine. Uh, and some, 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 it would be easy to argue that is architecture really happening in this space? But in the end, it was really about the photograph. Uh, in the same way that in, in the end, it might be about a rendering. Um, how do you create space 
either physically to get, you know, design that space, or how do you render that thing to make it feel like a real space? How do you design that space? Yeah, my studio last semester, uh, last, well, both semesters last year, uh, we, we had a physical studio only for model building, and then the studio met during studio hours on Zoom, uh, and then students would use the, the model building room to make models. They didn't have to all be there at the same time because it was socially distanced. We couldn't really get everyone in there. Um, and so I, I, I mean, I'm a strong believer in the nature of physicality as part of the, the learning process, whether it's full scale in like a design build studio or, or building models. Um, I think there's something that can't be simulated in that process. Um, so that work, by just the, as, a, as a plug, is in the Nebraska History Museum right now in an ex exhibition on the second floor. So please go see it before the end of the year when it closes. <laughs> well, and Jeff, I would say the thing that can't be simulated is scale. It's that yeah. kind of problem sure. that I was describing in the digital model yeah. where you're kind of zooming in and out and everything's uh -huh. seamlessly at different scales. In the physical model, it's just the stability there. So you can really understand, kind of put your scale figure and understand the space which especially for beginning design students is something really valuable when you feel a little bit disoriented in the virtual. Well, yeah, no, that's, that's really good. I think scale is very difficult to, to learn in a simulated world. But on the other hand, um, material constraints, the making of architecture often depends on the constraint of material. So Ethan was talking about you know, bending aluminum, and there's a, a, you know, the thing called the K factor, which is how much it stretches as you bend it. And that can be calculated. But until you actually bend it, you don't really know exactly where it's going to end up. And, yeah. and I think those but are... It's odd you say that, actually, Jeff, because there's, there's also a machine in, at NIS that simulates the welding process yes. as well. So they have in a VR machine... In order to weld, machine, you have to do it in a simulator. They have a VR machine there that allows you to learn how to weld without actually having to have any of that physicality. Right? And it, it, in some ways, it transgresses this space between experience uh, and, uh, you know, between the virtual experience and the real uh, application of it. The gap has been short. Yeah. I don't think one substitutes from the no, other. I, I think it accelerates it. I think it what it does is it accelerates yeah. the learning process so that there are fewer dangerous mistakes being made yeah. until one is sort of more up to speed with the technique and then you can, then you're sort of set loose on the, on the real material. Yeah. Well, I, um, I think it's probably my job as, as, the, as the chair uh, in addition to my colleague, Andre, there is the moderator to try and wrap things up because we've got a minute left over. Andre, do you want to have any, is there anything that you would like to say by way of conclusion? Um, we deeply appreciate your contribution. Um, so very, very distant, right? Still in the Zoom world. Um, Zoom world yeah. But I think, you know, where, where we're sort of ending right now in this conversation about um, how the, the virtual sort of augments or enriches but not really replaces um, a, a kind of hands-on you know, experience in real space. I think that is and continues to be the territory for more reflection. I'm thinking, for example, about the role of sight and sight analysis um, in this kind of realm of perhaps not being able to visit, yet having you know, other ways of sort of simulating an experience of visiting. Like we had one studio in which uh, a former student literally drove by car, you know, through the neighborhood and narrated um, the experiences of uh, of that site and of that neighborhood in a way that would have actually never happened, I think, had students just gone there on their own. So all this to say, right, that um, I think perhaps we are not in a place where we just default back to just doing everything in person again but really sort of carefully want to leverage um, what is augmented by um, the kind of mediating platforms, be it software or communication technologies like Zoom. So thank you all for opening up this uh, fantastic conversation and for the questions from the audience. Good, and uh, thanks to you and, and everybody who's here. I want to thank everyone who supported us, you know, the Dean, the school, Kerry, the uh, tireless work, and. And uh, just uh, to make some announcements, also, David, thank you too for initiating this. Um, just to announce that tomorrow night we have our, fir our first in-person Hyde lecture. So Anne-Marie Decker will be here at the Richards Hall, and you can see a real person in three dimensions <laughs> talking about architecture. Uh, 
And then on the 16th, they have a very real exhibition going on and part of Omaha by Design, which is my design build studio, XX Lamb, on the 16th of December. So those are, uh, those are upcoming events. And uh, it just leads me to thank, thank my colleagues, Peter, out, the, out there in Zoomland. Thank you, thank you so much, Zach, Bud, and Jeff. Again, thank you for your contributions. And uh, at this point, I want to draw a conclusion to the proceedings. <laughs>